Okay, so electrochemistry is all about chemical reactions that produce electricity, hence the name. So uh, there are two main types. The first type is what we call a voltaic cell. And a voltaic cell uses spontaneous reactions to create electricity, right? So these reactions, once they're connected, they happen on their own and they create electricity and that electricity can be used for other things. Think of a battery. The chemicals inside a battery, a battery is a voltaic cell. As long as you connect it to something else, the energy created within the battery, the electricity can be used to power other things, all right? Uh, I should also mention, voltaic in some older textbooks has another name. It's also called galvanic. So if you see the term galvanic, it means the same thing as voltaic. Okay, it's the spontaneous one. And that's the main, we're mainly going to be talking about voltaic today. But uh, the uh, second type, just to get it out there, is what we call electrolytic. And electrolytic uses electricity to make a non-spontaneous reaction occur. So uh, it requires outside help. These are all non-spontaneous reactions, but if electricity is provided from some outside source, then this can happen. If you've ever heard of electroplating, right, where you, where you plate uh, a metal onto some other surface, that requires electricity. That's an example of an electrolytic process. Okay? All right. So we'll talk about electrolytic later, probably the next lecture. All right. Um, there is two electrodes in either type of cell, the voltaic or electrolytic. You need to know what they are. The cathode is where reduction occurs. Just So just remember red cat. Red reduction is the site, or the reduction occurs at the cathode. Okay, red cat. The anode, anode is where oxidation occurs, right? So sometimes people try to remember an ox. Hey, an ox, look, there's an ox. That's, the anode is where oxidation occurs. Right, an ox, or as with a red cat, what is a cat and it's red? Okay, anyways. So the voltaic cells, uh, if you're gonna have voltaic cell and you want it to actually be useful, you need a way to transfer electrons from the anode to the cathode, All right? And when they do that, that's how they will do electrical work as they pass through an external circuit. Usually the external circuit is a wire. So, example. Um, the, elect the voltaic cell typically consists of two half cells. And what you're looking at here is two beakers, right? Each beaker is called a half cell. Now the beakers are interconnected in a couple of ways. Um, uh, first, let's talk about the, the beakers individually, I guess. So here in this first beaker, you can see that there is zinc ions, whereas in the second beaker, there are copper ions. Now, the zinc half cell will contain a bar of zinc or a rod of zinc or a piece of zinc metal. That zinc metal is partially or completely submerged in the zinc solution. On the other end, you've got a solid piece of copper. Likewise, it is also immersed in a copper solution. Now these two metal pieces are connected via wire and you know they're connected by some kind of alligator clip you guys know what i'm talking about electrical clips 
right? They could be soldered or they could be clipped. It doesn't matter as long as the metal wire has contact with the metal electrodes, right? Oh, and I should mention that we call these electrodes. Metal electrode, zinc metal electrode. Okay. So the reaction that's taking place is this. The reaction is solid zinc reacts with copper ion, and we end up forming copper solid and zinc ion. Now, from your knowledge of redox, you can look at this and pretty, pretty easily dissect it and determine what element is being oxidized, what element is being reduced. Right? So remember, the definition of oxidation is the loss of electrons. So which one of these is losing electrons as the reaction proceeds? The zinc. Yeah, so the zinc... is what's being oxidized and the copper, whoops, the copper goes from plus two to a solid state. And of course we know that that is reduction. Okay. Now, the interesting thing about half cells is that the reaction, the overall reaction says that zinc is reacting with copper ion. However, in our experimental setup, the zinc solid does not have direct contact with the copper solution. Right? If you look closely at this, where is the zinc solid? It's over here. Where is the copper solution? It's down here. The two are not in direct physical contact. Okay, but that's okay because that's the point of the wire. Every electric circuit needs to be a complete circuit. Right? And so there must be a path for, for charge to travel throughout the entire circuit. And so let's talk about the other parts. We already said that, that there's a wire here on top. Okay? And then the last, the fourth part of the circuit is what we call the salt bridge right here. And the salt bridge can be made several different ways. In this picture, the salt bridge is a glass tube. And that glass tube is usually filled with some kind of electrolytic gel. And it would contain some kind of uh, inert salt. The most typical ones are going to be sodium and nitrate. So sodium nitrate or sodium and sulfate. All right, there's some combination of ions that, that are known to be, um, you know, they're there. They conduct, they're electrolytes, but they don't necessarily undergo chemical reactions very easily. So, okay, so the fact that this bridge contains these ions, these ions in here, means there is a pathway for charges to be mobile and travel through. And that is what, in, in effect, completes the circuit. So let's talk about then specifics. At the zinc anode, okay, so right away they're telling you the zinc right here, the zinc metal electrode, an electrode is a generic term. Specifically, we're calling zinc the anode because anodes are where oxidation occurs. All right, and so if oxidation is occurring at the anode, that means electrons are being taken away. And so the electrons being taken away are actually pulled through the wire and they end up on the copper. We'll talk about, you know, why they go there in, in a little bit, but for right now, just see the electrons are being pulled from the zinc onto the copper. When that makes sense, because we said that copper is being reduced. Okay. So, Electrons go to the copper cathode. We're calling the copper electrode the cathode. Red cat. Reduction occurs at the cathode. So what's happening then uh, up close is
this copper electrode that has electrons kind of ro roaming all over it, remember that this copper electrode is submerged in copper solution. And so when the copper ions in solution make contact with that cathode, the electrons that are running around on the cathode latch on and reduce the copper ion and convert it into a copper solid atom. Right, so the more electrons that accumulate on the cathode, the more copper ions can be reduced. And so effectively what you're going to see then is that the cathode is going to become coated with a layer of copper metal. It's going to take on the appearance of copper. It's going to gain mass because there's copper atoms collecting up on it. And this should all make sense because copper ions are being reduced and they are in contact with a bunch with a source of electrons for reduction. So what happens as to the copper ion concentration in solution here as this continues to happen? It's going to go down, right? The more and more copper ions in solution that bump into the cathode, they're no longer copper ions anymore. And so the concentration of copper ion will go down. Okay. So that's half of the circuit. The fact that we have, we have electrons being pulled off the zinc, traveling over here, accumulating on the copper, and the reduction process occurs, right? So remember we said we need a complete circuit. All right, so what happens is this. As this react, uh, I'm gonna draw a second picture just cause there's not a whole lot of room on that main picture. It's the same cell, but I'm just drawing more room so I can show where ions are. Okay. So we said that the, the copper is accumulating. So the copper is solid. Accumulates. The concentration of copper ion is decreasing because it's being turned into copper solid. All right. So the salt bridge, we said, contains ions. It contains uh, sodium ions and nitrate ions. All right. On the other end, at the anode, so the zinc, if it's being oxidized, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna change the shape of this a little bit. The zinc electrode is going to be deteriorating because if you're gonna oxidize zinc and you pull electrons away, what's the product when you oxidize zinc? Ions, zinc ions, and zinc ions are no longer solid. They are soluble. So zinc concentration is increasing because the electrons are being pulled away from the zinc over to the copper. So let's pause here for a second and just look at that and make sure that makes sense. We're oxidizing zinc. Zinc is being turned into ions. Therefore, the concentration of zinc ions in the left half cell is increasing. You're making more and more zinc ions. On the right side, whatever copper ion concentration you had here, uh, the copper ions bump into the cathode. They get turned into solid. And therefore, the concentration of the copper ions is decreasing. You guys good with this so far? 
Okay? All right. So, in order for an electric circuit to be complete, right, you have to have a full circuit. So, whatever charge, there has to be charge balance between the left and the right side, the left and cell and the, ha and the right cell. So, on the right side, the concentration of positive ions is decreasing. So that means that this half cell is becoming uh, increasingly negative. So the right cell becomes more negative as the copper ions decrease. What's going on on the left side? We are producing more and more zinc ion. So this becomes more positive as zinc ions increase in concentration. So this is not something that is sustainable. Our left side is becoming more and more positive. Our right side is becoming more and more negative. If only there were some mobile ions that could move around and go where they could to help balance the charge disparity. Maybe over a structure over water or in a glass tube between beakers. That's where the salt bridge comes in, okay? so. In order to maintain electrical neutrality in both sides, the ions will be attracted to the side where they are needed in order to restore that charge equilibrium. So we will have the nitrates drawn towards the left half cell because that will help quell the increasing positive charge on that side. The sodium ions will be drawn and attracted towards the cathode because it, there needs to be, uh, there needs to replace the lack of positive ions on that side. And this is a natural process. This will happen on its own because the positive, if one side becomes more positive and one side becomes more negative, opposite ions attract. So, that is the purpose of the salt bridge, to maintain electrical neutrality between the half cells. You need some kind of, you need a combination of ions, positive and negative, that are relatively inert. All right. So, I think I, this, I think we answered a bunch of these questions through the drawing here. Identify the cathode. We said that the cathode was the copper. Reaction occurring there specifically is this. Identify the anode. The anode is the zinc metal. What's the reaction occurring there? It shows the oxidation of zinc to zinc ion. The salt bridge allows current to flow but prevents contact between zinc and copper ion. Why is this necessary? Okay, so remember I said that the copper um, or the zinc metal does not come in direct contact with the copper solution and yet the reaction still occurs, right? If I took a piece of zinc, just a solid chunk of zinc, and plunked it into a solution of copper, what you would see is the zinc would become coated with copper as copper ions are reduced upon contact. You've seen reactions like this before, right? Where you start to see like, you know, red metal appear on something else. So when that reaction occurs, there is electric potential that could be harvested. There is electricity that being made that could be collected, but you can't collect it if you just literally take the metal and plunk it into the solution. That is the whole point of the separation of cells. That is the point of the wire. 
because if we get electrons to travel through a wire, guess what we can do? Tap into that wire and use that, the electrons traveling through that wire and divert them into something like a light bulb or a computer or a phone, right? Or whatever it is you, that needs some kind of electrical power. So that's why we have, um, that's why we prevent contact. Right? Because preventing contact actually allows us to harvest the electricity. Whereas if you don't do this, then, then a reaction is happening, but you're not benefiting from it. Okay? All right. So there is what we call a shorthand notation because to describe an electrochemical cell, a voltaic cell, I could draw you a picture like this, or I could just use what's called shorthand notation. And so the shorthand notation shows you a solid, the ion at the solid, double lines means separation, that means a salt bridge. And then an ion and then another solid. So in other words, this is the anode, this is the bridge, this is the cathode. A, B, C is the pattern. They tell you, that describes what you have at the anode, it describes the separation where the bridge would be, and then it describes what you have at the cathode. So based on a shorthand description, you should be able to uh, set up a cell diagram showing everything respectively in its place. Again, two half cells or two beakers. Okay, so the first thing listed is the, uh, is the anode. Then the ion present at the anode, which is the zinc ion. Then it mentions the bridge, the separation is the bridge. And then it says that in the second cell, the solution is copper ion. And then the cathode itself is made up of solid copper. And then there is a wire joining them. I could give you a myriad of combinations and you should be able to just draw it the same way based on what I give you in that ABC pattern, okay? Okay, so uh, we mentioned, we answered some of these before. What will happen to the mass of the anode? So the mass of the anode we said would decrease. The cathode will increase in mass because it's gaining atoms. What will happen to the concentration of the zinc? The zinc is the anode ion. So we said that's going to increase. We're going to accumulate that. And the cathode ion will be used up because the cathode ion is a reactant. OK. So let's take a look at another example. The reaction between zinc and hydrogen ion. It's going to produce zinc ions and hydrogen gas. So this setup is going to be similar, but it's going to be different. And the reason why it's different is because one, there's only one electrode that is made up of a metal. The other electrode involves the gas. And of course, gas is not a solid substance. So in a setup like this, We, cannot, we need to use what's called an inert electrode. So this, this electrode here is still zinc. But this is an inert electrode. And the inert electrode, there's a couple different types. OK, so it could be either graphite. And that's what we mean by carbon, right? graphite, or it could be platinum, or it could be what's called nichrome wire, okay, which is a um, chrome-plated nickel wire. So those three are the most common inert electrodes because they will not interfere. They, they won't react during the reaction. They are just a conduit for the electrons to flow. Now, why do we need those? 
Well, because you don't want a different metal there. If, the, if you're trying to observe the reaction of, between hydrogen to form hydrogen gas, so imagine hydrogen ions. Well, if I want to make hydrogen gas, the hydrogen must be reduced. And so that means the hydrogen ions need to come into contact with the source of electrons to be reduced, which means the electrons, again, are flowing towards the cathode, which the electrons are always flowing towards the cathode because the cathode is the site of reduction. That's the anode. Here's our cathode. And the reaction that takes place right here is H plus plus two electrons to form H2. So then, based on that description, the cell notation hopefully makes sense. Uh, note that the if you're using an inert electrode in your shorthand notation, you will write which inert electrode it is in parentheses. In this case here, they're describing the platinum. But it, you, can, you can write in nichrome, you can write in graphite. Okay. So are you guys getting okay with this idea of half cells? Half cells, two beakers, there's going to be a... Oh, I forgot the cell bridge. How are the poor ions going to cross over? Was the salt bridge, and of course in the salt bridge we use the standard, the same standard uh, suspects: sodium sulfate, sodium nitrate. You know. Okay. So, now that we've described the structure of a cell, let's talk a little bit more. Uh, okay, those. We've already just discussed these, right? Two half cells, wire connecting. One is the anode, one is the cathode. Uh, we, use, we talked about inert electrodes. Electron flow is shown by an arrow by the external circuit like this. This is what it's talking about. In the wire, show the direction of the, of the electrons. Now, I know that in a couple of examples that I've drawn, in each one of them, the electrons are traveling from left to right. Don't think that you have to draw the anode on the left side. You might see a picture where the anode is on the right side. It's arbitrary where you put the anode and cathode. You just have to make sure you understand what, what the site of reduction is, and that is where the electrons will go. Okay? Okay. Um, so, now, I'm going to, okay, so we talked about, Sorry, I'm going back up here again. We talked about how we know which side is being oxidized and which side is being reduced. And this has to do with what's called reduction potential. So I'm going to hand out a list for you guys to look at. This is a reference sheet. And this will be very useful to you, this unit. And you're going to be drawing from this a lot. So just like the periodic table of this unit. And there's actually a periodic table on the back of it as well. The periodic table on the back is the official periodic table that you get. Notice how they don't have polyatomic ions and they don't give you their names. It's just bare bones. It's, it's the atomic number and atomic mass. Okay, so anyways, when you're looking at this, this is what we call a reduction potentials list. Okay, and that the way that this is set up is, uh, they show you a half reaction, and these reactions on here, all of these half reactions are reductions. If you look at it, you can see that there's something gets gaining electrons and ends up forming, you know, a product. And there's also uh, an E. An E. All right? This is electric potential. Okay? And the unit that we measure this in is volts. Or just V. So, the higher the value 
the higher the reduction potential, the more easily reduced. So clearly on this sheet, the highest reduction potential is the reduction of fluorine. So let's stop and think about this for a second. We, when we studied electro, uh, period, periodicity and electron behavior, we talked about things like effective nuclear charge. We talked about things about radius and ionization energy. And so remember how uh, we have a high effective nuclear charge on the far right side of any of the periodic table, but also the smaller the atoms, right, the attraction is greater. So fluorine here has the greatest ability to draw electrons towards itself. And that is represented elect electrically here on this chart. So this is, of course, this is not exhaustive. This is not every single reduction that can take place, but these are the most common ones that you're gonna need to see and be able to apply. Okay, so now looking at the very bottom, lithium. How likely is it that lithium will gain an electron and become reduced? According to this chart, not very. In fact, the likelihood is so low that we assign it a negative reduction potential. Unlikely to reduce a lithium ion, or at least not easily, okay? So, we use these, the first, first thing is you're gonna use this for is to gauge the relative reduction ability or likelihood to be reduced for any particular ion. Okay, so let's just a simple example. What's easier to reduce? Uh, if I give you two choices, silver ion versus lead two. You're just really looking for the higher magnitude of the reduction potential. Which one has a higher reduction potential? Silver. Yeah, so silver. Silver, silver has a 0.8, whereas the lead is negative 0.13. Okay. Yeah. Question. So, if lead two has like a negative reduction potential, does that mean it's does that mean like the reverse, like lead being oxidizes very likely? Yes. The the once anything towards the bottom of this list is more likely to be oxidized as opposed to reduced. Okay. So, lower reduction potential more likely to be oxidized. Now, if we're reading this list and we're saying that things on the bottom are more likely to be oxidized, what you need to realize is that this table is a list of reductions. So it does not accurately represent an oxidation unless you reverse the reaction. So what is, what is the most likely to be oxidized element here? Lithium, but the oxidation reaction for lithium is not on here. You would have to reverse it. Okay, so if lithium's reduction potential is negative 3.05, oh, by the way, this is the sim, uh, you got to be able to write these E sub red because this is a reduction potential then the reverse reaction is what we call an oxidation potential. And the oxidation potential will be the opposite of what the reduction potential was as listed. So in other words, your oxidation potential is really the opposite of negative 3.05. So E ox is 3.05. Oops, that's off the screen. Okay, so 
understand that if I ever asked, if I ever, if you ever need to write the oxidation of one of these, you're going to have to reverse the direction of the equation and then flip the sign. Okay, question, Angela. How long hydrogen takes to Ah, okay, so hydrogen is what we call this is a reference. And the reason why hydrogen has a value of zero is because every single one of these elements was tested against hydrogen. And so their level of reduction potential is relative to hydrogen. So we will always use H plus as zero. So anything above hydrogen on this list means it's more likely to be reduced than hydrogen. And anything below it is more likely to be oxidized than hydrogen. Okay. All right. So... Now that we've gone over that little background, let's talk about calculating voltages for uh, an electro, electro or um, a val voltaic cell. Okay. Um, when, we when we talk about cell potential, in the physics world, this is known as electromotive force. All right, we don't, we're not going to call it that too much here. But the idea is that when electricity flows, it's like a waterfall. It generally only flows in one direction. Water always flows from the top of the mountain down to the basin, all right, or to the ocean, or wherever it's going, okay? From higher to lower potential energy, kind of like when energy change is negative. Oh, like free energy. Hmm, it's sort of coming together. So electromotive force, we're going to call cell potential, and we use the symbol E cell. E sub cell. We measure cell potential in volts. Now, the unit of a volt is actually the ratio of joules over charge, or energy over charge, right? So this is energy in joules. And this is called the charge, and it's measured in coulombs, as in Coulomb's law. But we can just use volts. You can just use V as your symbol. All right. Standard voltage. Any, every time I use standard in front of something, it's always referring to a specific set of conditions. And if, since I'm using standard, the conditions I'm referring to are one atmosphere, 25 degrees, and because their solutions are involved, standard uh, conditions, standard concentration is one molar. So that part is new. You already knew the one atmosphere. You already knew 25 degrees. Okay, but one molar solutions. We will talk about non-standard concentrations later. That's like one of the last things we do. All right. So um, we've already talked about how hydrogen is the standard. Okay. Um, the main thing we need to be able to calculate is this. We need to be able to calculate standard cell potential. And I have already alluded to reduction potentials. The reduction potentials here, these are literally from your chart. Because these values are at standard conditions. They are all measured at 25 degrees. They are measured at one atmosphere pressure. And if they are solutions, they're one molar. Okay, You can tell that they're standard. How can you tell on this table that these are standard? What is the, the giveaway? Oh, it tells you at the top, but also it, it has this. Right here. The degree sign. Degree sign is an indication of standard conditions. If you see E without that degree sign, that means you are not operating under standard conditions. Okay, so that's important. Understand the significance of that little degree sign above the voltage symbol. Okay, so when a cell is operating, there are two processes. There's a reduction and there's an oxidation. And you can get those values from this chart and then you will add them accordingly. So... The more positive the reduction potential is, the stronger it is the it's the stronger it's an oxidizing agent. 
And remember, if something's a good oxidizing agent, that means it itself is easily reduced. The more positive the oxidation potential, the stronger it is as a reducing agent, or in other words, more likely to be oxidized. Now remember, E-ox is the opposite of E-red. This table does not list oxidation potentials. You have to manually flip them. It would be too confusing to give you two lists. So we just give you the one and you just kind of operate with the one. If the voltage that you calculate is greater than zero, that's a spontaneous reaction. So if you calculate volts to be anything above zero, that's spontaneous. And likewise, if it's less than zero, then it's not spontaneous. All right, so I'm gonna back up and now we're going to apply this, this equation to the first cell that we observed. So backing up here, going back to the beginning, here. All right, I'm going to use a color that's a little different. Okay. So E cell equals E red plus E ox. On, since we have now identified what the reaction or what the oxidation and what the, uh, the reduction is, on your chart, can, can you look up and find the reduction of copper? What is the value for the reduction of copper? 0.34 volts. Okay. Now, zinc is being oxidized. So find where zinc is. Remember, on here, it's going to be a reduction of zinc. Find where zinc is. And we're going to use the opposite of its value. So what's the value for zinc listed on here? It's listed as negative 0.25, right? Oh, totally looking in the wrong place. Yeah, 0.76, okay. Negative 0.76. Okay, so that means E ox is positive 0.76. Okay, so that means E cell is going to be 0.34 plus 0.76, which is 1.1 volts. If we build this cell as shown, then our potential that it could deliver is 1.1 volts. And this is just one combination of elements. You've got this many as far as possibilities. So depending on how much voltage we need, we can choose different combinations and we can end up getting a higher or lower voltage. All right, so now that you know that, we're just going to, I'm going to give you a couple examples, and I want you to tell me, um, I'm, going to, I'm going to insert a page here. All right, I want you to find out what's being oxidized, what's being reduced, and what the cell potential will end up being, okay? And I'm going to give you shorthand notation. So. Actually, we'll just do one at a time. Let's just do this one first. Write the half reaction, determine the, reduction, the individual potentials, and then what the overall potential is. Uh, 
Oh, you know what? I'm going to change this. Sorry. Chromium is a weird one. Chromium doesn't go fully. Uh, let's change that to CAD. CAD. Uh, we do Chromium on here? Oh, yeah, we'll leave it. So what do you guys think? What is our, or let's, let's break this down. What is my uh, anode half reaction? Chromium. Okay, so anode represents the oxidation half, right? So this is our anode half reaction. That represents an oxidation, so that's going to be E ox. Now, the chromium reaction written on your chart is backwards compared to this. And so what we're going to do is we're going to need to take the opposite of it. So net the opposite of negative 0.74. Or in other words, 0.74. Okay, our cathode. is the reduction of lead and that is that does not need to be changed that's just taken straight off of here which is a negative 0.13 so e cell is e red plus e ox so negative 0.13 plus 0.74 so point six one volts. The fact that it is a positive voltage means it's a spontaneous and this will happen on its own. All right. This is this is about as far as I need you to get today. So let's recap. Electrochemical cells, there's two types. One produces electricity, one requires it. We only talked about the one that produces it today, right? The voltaic cell. Voltaic cell is going to have two half cells. The half cells will be a combination of a metal and its solution. They will be connected by a wire, and there will also be some kind of salt bridge. The voltage that is produced is a combination of the half reactions, one of us, which is an oxidation, one of which is a reduction. And as long as you write the oxidation as an oxidation, that means you have to flip the direction relative to your sheet. Add them up. If your voltage is positive, it's spontaneous. Okay? All right.